Good evening and welcome to Superintendent's Corner. My name is Richard Sapphire, Superintendent of Schools, and uh, this show is an opportunity to look at the issues, the challenges, the successes facing the Gloucester Public Schools, and more importantly, to have conversations with the people who are responsible for addressing all of those issues. Tonight we have a special guest. Uh, we have our principal from Gloucester High School, Mr. James Cook, and thank you for coming on the program. Yeah, thank you for having me we again. Really appreciate it. Uh, this is your second time on the program, time, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Uh, you were a rookie a couple of three years ago, and now you're in your third year as principal? That's right, third year. Okay, terrific. Uh, no shortage of challenges, I presume? Oh, there's a lot going on at the high school. <laughs> as, as I tell people all the time, it's never boring. <laughs> I'm sure. So let's see if we can parse a couple of these. Sure. Um, one of the first things I'd like to talk about is this uh, process of accreditation, the New England Association of Schools and Colleges. Um, I know that you're currently in the process of preparing for the re-accreditation and right. gone through a self-evaluation. Maybe you can sort of sure. walk us through that. Yeah, so uh, NIASC is uh, an independent body, uh, that, uh, so it's non-governmental. Um, uh, but what they do for us is they, um, they come into a school um, and, and they make sure that the school is meeting uh, certain standards. Um, most of the standards focus on teaching and learning. Uh, but also they look at the building and they look at uh, your support structures, um, you know, to sort of be, be able to say that, you know, you're doing the right things and assure some folks outside the school that you're doing the right things. Mm -hmm. So whether that's parents and whether that's uh, post-secondary schools um, and also uh, employers and such that, yeah, that's a great place to, you know, to get mm -hmm. a degree from. Mm -hmm. So the process has been a little bit different uh, now than it was 10 years ago. Um, uh, as, a, as a teacher in the building, the, the process we, we went by before, um, we did a self-study that took many years. Uh, NIAS came in um, at the end of the process and sort of told you how you were doing. This way, uh, the way they're doing it now is a lot better. You do a, a brief um, self-assessment, mm -hmm. took us last spring into this summer. Um, many, many teachers involved. It was a very teacher-centered uh, process. Uh, we also had feedback from parents and from students as well mm -hmm. in the uh, self-assessment. Um, and then right at that point, NIASC uh, does a consultation visit and they collaborate with the school on coming up with a plan for making improvements. Mm. So that's the phase we're in right now. In fact, um, we're working with uh, NIASC on the draft of the consultation report, which will then become a school growth plan and that school growth plan is uh, parallel with the school improvement plan mm -hmm. um, that we bring before the school committee every year. Right. It sounds as though they're not leaving you out there on your own as a school for a, a longer period of time, but rather intervening earlier, uh, facilitating and helping right. you to develop a, a growth plan. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and so most of what they saw really corroborates the work we're already doing. They're really excited about some of the work we've been doing about student student-centered inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, they've really been excited about the support services we have in place for mm -hmm. uh, mental health, mm -hmm. um, special education. Um, so they've been able to, uh, you know, sort of encourage us to keep going with some of the initiatives we have. Um, and then also give us an, um, some feedback on you know, the work that remains to be done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I imagine this culminates in a committee coming out to visit the school at a point in time, and then they will develop a final report. Okay. What's the timeline on all that business? Uh, the fall of 2020. Okay. They will be visiting uh, mm -hmm. to see how the growth plan's been going. Right. So we have uh, next school year, and then that fall they'll be here. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Before we turn around, right? That's right. I know. It's, uh, it's a lot of work. And uh, so... Uh, we're already planning for, uh, you know, next year and the fall to make mm -hmm. sure we have everything in place. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very systematic process if done correctly. That's right. Um, alongside that, and I think you alluded to it, the high school has been developing working groups called uh, student growth teams. So uh, what are these exactly? Uh, what are the titles or the names for sure. each of them? And what are some of the responsibilities? And I guess dovetail it with the work uh, for reaccreditation sure. as well. So, um, School growth teams were, were something that I put in place when I became principal as a way of organizing teachers around um, learning issues and, and student issues that the um, educators themselves have identified. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have, um, you know, 80 plus professionals in a building, all um, highly educated in their fields, highly educated in um, teaching and learning and how to make best use of that resource in an organized way mm -hmm. um, so that it's not, you know, just administrators making decisions and to about to give things. teachers voice That's as well. That's exactly right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So um, teachers are organized into one of uh, eight school growth teams. 
So those are things, um, there's an inquiry learning team, uh, there's a social emotional learning team, um, the team that looks at um, the, uh, student st the student study team, uh, folks that uh, look at uh, crisis intervention, and those are some of the topics. Um, you know, other topics are ninth grade transition, um, looking at uh, standards-based communication with parents, which is, which is always um, sort of tricky of mm -hmm. kind of translating some of uh, teacher speak to, uh, you know, communicating with parents. So those are some of the issues. Um, the issues were first identified on collaboration between teachers and administrators, and then um, teachers uh, chose um, a handful of teams they'd be interested in, and they were assigned to one of those teams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The work that uh, folks do on the teams is to study an issue. So the scheduling team, for instance, has been researching different forms of scheduling and have uh, recently been going on visits to other schools that have uh, schedules, not just different schedules for the sake of it, but schedules that address, for example, um, issues around social emotional learning and issues around um, structures that provide students with sufficient support for their education. Mm. We're very proud of Gloucester High School not to have study halls. Mm -hmm. But then there's the drawback of not having study halls is where does that time come from for students to do um, guidance appointments and um, um, you know, students who do need some interventions mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. to, to support their learning mm -hmm. during the day. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the scheduling team has looked at how other schools have used uh, flex blocks and advisory periods to provide those services. Um, and that all came from uh, this teacher um, inquiry into the problem. Mm -hmm. And then uh, they're in the process now of making proposals to the, and working with the administration on, okay, what is it going to look like going mm -hmm. forward? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a study and then making proposals and working with the administration on outcomes from mm -hmm. the proposals. Mm -hmm. You've spoken before, at least with me, about the whole concept of having advisory groups or advisory okay. blocks. Could you just sort of elaborate on that sure. a little bit? Sure, so, so this would be a block during the day where, um, and the frequency could vary. That's one of the things we're studying right now mm -hmm. is how often would the advisory period uh, take place? Is this something for every day? Is this um, you know, once or twice in a seven day cycle? Mm -hmm. but, but some of the work that would happen there is teacher, uh, students could be assigned to or could choose to work with uh, a teacher in which say they have a lab to make up. So the seven or eight students who have missed a lab in a teacher's three sections of a course would all go to the teacher mm -hmm. during that advisory period. Mm -hmm. While other students are, say, getting help from their math teacher, um, and other students might be working with guidance counselors on um, their college admission essays. Mm -hmm. um, there are systems that schools have used to help them organize where, and, and create uh, attendance, right, to make sure students are going mm -hmm. you know, where they need to be during those times. Um, advisory times um, can also be days where we schedule um, when we have uh, need to speak to the students on a particular issue, say seniors around uh, prom and graduation and so on, um, speak to freshmen as we enter uh, mid-year exam mm -hmm. on how, how mm -hmm. to deal with mid-year mm -hmm. exams and prepare for them properly. Um, so we can look at a whole year of advisories and then plan out each session and mm -hmm. what may happen during mm -hmm. each session. Mm -hmm. uh, and so many of the things that we um, have to squeeze in, catch as catch can during the year, could be planned more intentionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, it's interesting as I look over the list, there are a number of them that deal with the um, less academic, more social-emotional. Right. Uh, you had mentioned a social-emotional working group, mm -hmm. a student study team working group, a crisis intervention team working group, and I'm gonna ask about grade nine, but grade nine transition. Uh, group as well. All of those, in part, are working with um, the emotional aspect to yeah. student life, which I think speaks volumes uh, with respect to what we are encountering in schools and um, uh, the obligation that we feel that we have to provide as much necessary support as we possibly can uh, for students coming into our buildings and the like. Are there, um, can you just briefly, you a social emotional a student study and a crisis intervention sound, at least at, at face value, to have similar kinds of yeah. responsibilities, but there must be distinctions there as well. There are, yeah. So crisis intervention team um, 
they'll look more at uh, school safety issues. Mm -hmm. um, they're the team that has helped us prepare for our ALICE trainings. Okay. Um, in, in recent times, uh, they'll look over the school safety plan and mm -hmm. look for holes, look mm -hmm. for things that we want to improve upon. Mm -hmm. um, so as we do that every year, their input is incredibly valuable. Um, that is the, the body that will debrief uh, after um, a fire drill or after a, um, like I say, the ALICE. Um, school safety trainings mm -hmm. um, and help us prepare. Um, some of them even help administration with uh, observations of mm -hmm. how we're doing in, right. you know, with, with the, um, you know, response to um, you know, the potential, potential for, for school for, violence. For, for tragedy, yeah. That's right. So, exactly. so, so that team has that focus. Um, uh, the focus of the uh, student study team. Um, so every Thursday we have a student study team uh, with uh, counselors, both um, you know traditional guidance counselors, adjustment counselor, um, the uh, school psychologist, and the um, a special education um, program leader, nurses, etc. Mm. Meet every Thursday. What we thought we um, needed was to get some feedback from teachers about um, how that group could best um, um, support teaching and learning that happens in a classroom, um, it's difficult, you know, t teachers are invited to come in um, to talk about students they may uh, want to study, but many teachers don't really know the inner workings of the SST. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this was a way to um, pair up folks who are in the classroom with people who are doing the, um, more of the direct support. Mm -hmm. um, so SST team has been talking about how to manage this, because they're two very different worlds, right? Mm -hmm. One is really organized by the block schedule and right. content and yeah. uh, assessments of students, and the other is, is really looking at the uh, health needs, both physical health and mental health of students. Um, and those, um, this is, that team is an opportunity for those folks to talk to each other mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. how best to work together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then social emotional learning really has to do with, um, the, most recently uh, they did a presentation around um, mindfulness and meditation for students. How this is something that can be, uh, how, what are the particular strategies teachers can use to help recenter students? Mm -hmm. uh, this is something elementary school teachers have been doing for quite a while mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. and you know, in the last three years at the high school, uh, we've been taking seriously, and you know, what can we learn from some of those strategies? And of course, they're gonna look different when you're dealing with a 16, 17, 18 year old right, uh, right. than when you're dealing with much younger students. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the team came into a faculty meeting and we did some mindfulness and meditation mm -hmm. practices mm -hmm. ourselves. <coughs> they also presented resources to the faculty to use, um, use in their classrooms when they feel they need to recenter students, whether that's with a whole class or you know, individual students who need that recentering, or whether it's uh, experiencing anxiety before a test and what we can help students with. Um, this last go around with mid-year exams, among the resources we posted for parents, not only did, um, we post on the website and share out through email um, the normal, you know, study tips for. for but we also shared out um, exam prep meditation mm -hmm. uh, videos so yeah, to help focus on your breathing and That's right. stuff like that. Uh, there's a, a fellow who's going to be offering, um, I think, a six week, one day a week um, a course for teachers in mindfulness. Oh, that's I, great. Uh, I think uh, his first session will be in and around March the 13th. I was going to wait till February and send it out to the faculty at large and see who might be interested. And it came through the Gloucester Education Foundation. So uh, more on that later and to the extent to which it reinforces and supports some of the work that's being done in the high school, uh, it'll, it'll... I think there'll uh, be a lot of interest in, good. in, in that. Yeah. Uh, right. And, and, and that team also is looking now particularly around um, LGBTQ plus um, issues in our school and, and how to make sure we're an inclusive environment and the next professional development late January mm -hmm. will be uh, around those issues with someone from uh, the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education coming in mm. to do that PD. Mm -hmm. So um, so I should maybe give us a sense of the different um, foci of the three different groups. <laughs> I never get a chance to use that word too no, often. <laughs> foci is a good one. And I wasn't a science teacher, so. All right. Right. <laughs> Let's shift gears just a little bit. Uh, speaking of social emotional needs, um, becoming a freshman is a challenge. Sure. Uh, eighth grade, uh, middle school at large uh, is a time for, you know, expansive uh, social emotional growth and uh, emotional maturity and physical changes and psychological changes. And then comes the challenge of high school and the freshman yeah. year. 
So what is that challenge and uh, what steps uh, is the high school taking to try to help these kids along? Sure, so um, as I said earlier, one of our school growth teams is looking at that very issue mm -hmm. and making rec some recommendations, um, uh, particularly making recommendations about what a um, freshman uh, academy or freshman house might look like at Gloucester High School mm -hmm. and, and what it would take, because that would be a, a we would need a plan in place to, mm -hmm. to bring that about since it would be a different structure. And then there are the things we can do right now, um, looking at you know um, what that structure would do, what are some of the other things even without that. And, 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 and what I mean by that is um, uh, there are ways of, um, of uh, one approach is sink or swim, sort of approach, and then there's uh, <laughs> teaching students how to swim. And he, has, and he has a couple of bricks while you're right. At it. So, so um, in other words, when um, here are having teachers be very explicit with students about what the expectations are mm -hmm. you know, and what the resources are to help them meet those expectations. Mm -hmm. And then, and, and doing that in a way that is um, not just about putting the expectations out into the world and saying, eh, uh, they're there if you look at them, right. but being very insistent and repeating what the expectations are and mm -hmm. what the supports are for helping them meet the expectations, mm -hmm. and then sharing that out with parents as well, right. um, n and not just waiting for the parents to ask right. about them or waiting for the students right. to ask about right. them, or saying it's there on the website or something mm -hmm. like that. So one practice, uh, one particular uh, social studies teacher at the high school um, regularly will use um, some upcoming event, it could be mid-year exams for example, and very much three weeks ahead of time walking students through what that's like, mm -hmm. anticipating what some of the problems students face with say the mid-year exams, mm -hmm. waiting too long to study, um, uh, there's a little bit more freedom around mid-year exams in terms of um, uh, you know, there's a there's an open campus lunch. Mm -hmm. Some mm -hmm. students might struggle to get back to school on time for the 12:30 start. Mm -hmm. So, as a teacher, uh, this this particular teacher will uh, observe recently will anticipate some of those problems students might face, and then you know sort of talk the students through them. Right. So, um, anticipating some of the problems students might face, and then um, you know before they. Proactively rather than reactively is mm -hmm. one of the things that helps with the ninth grade team. Um, another uh, approach that's really important is making sure that we collaborate uh, together. So the, the the guidance counselor, the dean of students, and the teachers, um, you know, working together and working with the parents when students do um, run into you know um, difficulties completing work, um, they may face increased homework. Um, they may face increased um, uh, sort of the, re the repercussions of failing a course are mm -hmm. greater mm -hmm. suddenly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're not picking up credits. You might not be able to progress right. towards graduation yeah. um, on time. And uh, the in intervening, um, say at the end of first term, SST, the student study team, went through the list of all the freshman failures, mm -hmm. that who have, freshmen who failed multiple courses, mm -hmm. and made sure we had some kind of intervention, mm -hmm. uh, discussed mm -hmm. an intervention mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. about each of the kids mm -hmm. who had multiple right. failures. So that's what I mean about the collaborative approach. So there's the role of the teacher in the classroom who can uh, maybe, in, you know, in addition to teaching their content, help the students plan for homework, break down assignments into pieces, uh, make sure parents are aware and can support that. Um, uh, anticipating some things that st students get into trouble with, right? right? That lead lead to difficulties for students as a t teacher. And then there's the support staff um, having times during the year where we can intervene and help freshmen with the transition. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it's not only a matter of um, taking on the larger load that freshman students experience, but there's also the whole piece about executive functioning, what you That's were right. just describing about organizing and yes. taking things into pieces and processing things certain ways right. and and uh, making sure you've got all your you know, right. ducks lined up and yep. it's 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 a real it's a it's a rite of passage it but is. a very necessary one it is and okay. so you know one of the other things teachers do is building in <coughs> to uh, say a grade for a class how you maintain a notebook mm -hmm. in an organized manner mm -hmm. right and that's not necessarily a spanish skill but it is a high school skill correct um, one which a year later, two years later, we expect students to have mm -hmm. 
and you're not getting credit for it. You just have to have it, so you right. have the materials you need and are able right. to study when you need. But that, as a freshman, it is something that we're checking in on mm -hmm. um, in part of um, the assessment for a student. How are they doing with the executive functioning right. skills? Right. And, I, and at the very beginning, what I liked uh, hearing is that we're not just teaching them about the expectations and how to approach them, but we keep reminding them and keep reinforcing it and reinforcing right. it not only with the students, but with the parents as well. Yeah. well so. We all know that sense of, I told you, <laughs> and sort of, as a, a former mentor said, you have to tell them at least three times, right. at right. minimum. Right. 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 I've heard you say in the past that there is a balance between teaching the foundational skills to learning, and uh, foundational skills and understandings, and the use of inquiry as an application. Right. Um, so that's one of the core ideologies, I think, that uh, drives your thinking and drives uh, the high school. So uh, can you talk in terms of how do schools and classrooms establish a balance between those foundational skills and understandings and the use of what uh, you have referred to in the past as inquiry uh, or the means for applying those skills and understandings? And uh, if you can tie in the whole uh, Next Generation MCAS and its <laughs> expectations, then we may have to extend the show to an hour instead of 20 <laughs> minutes, but see what I'll you can do. I'll do my best. See yeah, what you can do. I'll do my best. So, um, so as you say, a guiding principle at Gloucester High School um, and a, a guiding principle for my teaching for uh, 20 years has been around um, making sure students have foundational skills that are transferable to other contexts. Transferable skills, transferable content um, that provides a, a foundation for other learning that happens later. So, um, and that is the, um, it is those foundational skills and that foundational content that um, at its best, the, the MCAS assesses, right? Um, you know, um, so for example, in the English, um, the new ELA test, um, increasingly students are being asked to um, read one text or multiple texts and being able to identify how that text functions in terms of uh, making its point providing details, how this piece um, speaks to an issue differently from this piece. Now that's something we do in our daily lives mm -hmm. all the time as citizens and in our work, right? That's a common foundational skill. Mm -hmm. You go into psychology, you go into teaching, you go into the sciences, right? You work in business, you're gonna be using that, that foundational skill. Um, and then, you know, within say biology, within history, there are foundational, there's foundational knowledge that as an educated person we're expected to have. So those, that, that, that's the foundation. Um, people will sometimes say about foundations in 2019, why do we need a foundation? You can just Google it. Mm. Well, without a foundation of knowledge, we don't know what to Google. How do we navigate mm -hmm. the, 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 the massive amounts of information that are out there? How do we even know what to search for to solve a problem? Mm -hmm. So you do need a foundational skills to search and discern what's real and what's not, and also some content knowledge to also um, know what to look for and know what you're looking at when you're there. But with the foundation, you're then able to, um, with the access to information that we have, do what, what we call inquiry investigate more deeply, mm -hmm. ask questions of your own about the content that your teacher has, has, has been te teaching you um, because of your curiosity, because it matches with some other area of interest of yours. Construct an understanding, communicate that understanding with somebody else, either as a group or mm -hmm. you know, as one person communicating with another person, um, and then reflect on that process. What did you learn in doing this? Uh, where did you go wrong? Where did it go amiss? Uh, what, if you, um, what might you need to follow up on mm -hmm. after the fact? Mm -hmm. That's the inquiry process. Um, that inquiry process is you know, something we see in the humanities. It's something we see in the sciences. Engineering, it looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It looks a little bit different when you're diagnosing a, uh, an engine that isn't working, an auto shop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the basic principle underlies all of the, um, <clears throat> the upper level areas at Gloucester High School. You know, when you're getting into photography, uh, advanced photography, you're getting into um, auto four, you're getting into AP psychology, the same sort of transferable skills are there. Um, and at the upper level, students are able to go delve in more deeply, mm -hmm. ask more of their own questions, um, and are the authors of their education using the foundational skills um, that they got earlier and um, using the teacher guidance and teacher's understanding of resources and um, 
and challenging students at mm -hmm. the upper levels. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A very simple analogy is, um, as I'm listening is uh, as a flashlight, I, I have to get up early in the morning sometimes, take the dog out for a walk, and I can't go into the side or backyard unless I've got that flashlight because I can't see anything and I can't possibly navigate my way. It's particularly made worse by the ice and the <laughs> slight slant that I have uh, as the pathway uh, moves towards the house and the like. Um, in the same way, we're teaching, you're seeking to teach kids to use their minds as that flashlight. Right. The flashlight, perhaps, in a way, uh, I'm not sure if this is accurate, in a way is the foundational skills or it's the tools that you're given, not the best connection by way of analogy, but the using of the mind as the light source itself, and that there are ways in which that light can be carved up uh, mentally, in terms of cognition, understanding, and attached uh, to your own judgments and values. I mean, there's an exceptional amount of uh, thinking uh, that is associated with this whole process. Yeah. And if we're not, if we're not in, in the business of trying to teach kids to do that, then I'm not quite sure why we're sitting across. It's one, one of another. the things that's most <laughs> exciting about our time is this challenge that we have mm -hmm. around the information that's available, but then helping students navigate that intelligently. Um, and so, you know, so the foundation of knowledge and skills is so important for how to navigate that. Mm -hmm. And even the disposition to be, a nav to be somebody right. who uses a flashlight, right. somebody who actively themselves is curious about what's in the corner over there right. Um, right. And, and is gonna go take a look at it. And so, and, and really for me, the, and for many of the teachers at Gloucester High School, it's the, the excitement that some, a student gets Again, whether in the you know machine technology when they're working with CNC equipment and discovering that and and, and imagining what they could do mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. manufacturing technology, you know, or it's somebody in um, you know an engineering manufacturing and design class using the 3D printers, or again somebody in the arts who has learned a bunch of um, techniques and now has a vision mm -hmm. of creating something mm -hmm. um, using those techniques. Um, you know, seeing that excitement is really what it's about. Um, the, the thrill around building tools and then applying those tools to solving problems and creating new things. Right, right. And um, as I think you've already described, the malleability of the concept of the framework of inquiry and its, and its adaptability to engineering, science, career and vocational tech, English and, and art and everything else. Right. Uh, my presumption is that the, the faculty at large uh, is buying into this concept. Yeah, I think, and, and the tension is the one I've described, which mm -hmm. is between the foundational knowledge, you know, so these are the conversations right. we have, how much of the foundational knowledge and how much of that op more open-ended applied learning right. taking place at any time, and, and, and sometimes students are in a position where they need more here, and, and then you know, right. we have to push in this direction, and then sometimes you know, there are open-ended projects, and, and you wonder, well, what are the transferable skills being learned mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. this open-ended project? Right. So, you know, and that's, yeah. the, that's the hard work, right. figuring well, that it, out. It sounds like uh, extraordinary work, uh, a really collective effort. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up, so thank you very much. Sure. And for tuning into this segment of Superintendent's Corner, I thank you, and good night.